Hello students, welcome to study IQ. In this session, we are going to talk about history. Okay, so in this session, we will be discussing up to 1844. Okay, so we will try to cover up to 1844. So we have already started off with our discussion and we have reached uh, till Lord William Bentick. So what I'll do is, as usual, I'll go for a quick recap of what all things that we have done. Most of the students who are attending this video might be new students. So in that context, I'm going for the uh, discussion of what all things that we have covered. Maybe I'll take 10 minutes to explain what all things that we have done. So if you're continuing with the previous video, you can skip the 10 minutes if you're okay with it. Otherwise, I have done a different series where I am specifically talking about different different governor generals. There is no repetition. There is no recap. You can watch that videos and you can complete your history so here what i'm going to do is up till see we have stopped up to 1835 so in this session basically i'm talking about 1835 to 1844 but still first 10 minutes i'll talk about what all things which has happened till 1835 so some of the students who's taking exam in 2021 you can go for a recap here and even if you have attended the session i'm going to help you in revising what all things that we have done so far okay so if you are new here and if you are seeing these videos for the first time if you are new to this channel please consider subscribing the channel okay so let's get started with our discussion so if you see uh, we have started off with 1757 so we discussed about battle of Plassey and the associated developments and then we have moved on to 17 1773 so in 1773 uh, we have discussed about regulating act okay so regulating act of 1773 so two important provisions that we have discussed the governor of bengal became governor general of bengal along with four council members and i've told you the appointment with respect to the governor general and the council members so the governor general is actually appointed by the company because he is the head of the company and the four members were appointed by the parliament and through this four members only the parliament is going to control the affairs of east india company in india so you can see as its name indicated is basically to regulate regulate the company by the parliament so this through uh, through these four members the parliament is going to regulate the company because the governor general alone cannot take any decisions now earlier governor can take decision now if the governor general if the if he need to take any decision you need to get the support of the majority that means governor general plus four members were there four council members were there governor general in council majority means three out of five right so governor general at least need the support of two people from here to implement any of his decision but right from day one three out of four gentlemen were always against warren hasting and for that reason he could not implement any of his decision and that's the most important problem that he faced during entire period okay and that problem will be overcame you we can see that the problem will be overcome later in the 1784 pits india act okay so i'll tell you how this problem has overcame so you just need to know who is the first governor general that is lord warren hasting can be asked and the first four members there are many other council members are going to come but you don't want to know the name of all the council members the first four you need to know okay the first four members were richard barrel philip francis george monson and john clavering so these four members were appointed by the parliament and through these four members the governor general and the company will be regulated or controlled by the parliament so that's about the first provision the second provision is related to a supreme court so that there was a provision that a supreme court has to be established and a supreme court was actually established in calcutta in 1774 so remember the act was in 73 the court was established in 74 okay but don't confuse this supreme court with the modern day supreme court modern day supreme court we will discuss when we discuss about 1935 government of india act so modern day supreme court we can trace back its origin from the federal court or the uh, the government of india act 1935 this supreme court is entirely different this is only for the trial of europeans because when the europeans came to india their legal system and indian legal system were totally different and they consider the indian legal system as barbaric very traditional orthodox etc so they need their law for the trial of their cases and the supreme court was established only for the trial of europeans and the first chief justice of this court was justice elijah impey okay so we have talked about few facts here we've talked about few names also warren hastings richard barwell philip francis george monson john clavering elijah impey so these are the few names which you need to remember why these four these few names because these are the first 
the governor general first governor general first council of ministers first chief justice okay so in that context you need to remember the name and then we have discussed the period between 73 to 85 that is a period of lord warren hastings and I've told you a main question there why Warren Hastings period in history is known as trial and error period okay and we have discussed many reasons also and I've told you how to support Warren Hastings and how to criticize Warren Hastings and how to frame your answer all these things we have already discussed so I'm not getting into the details of it so we have discussed the problems that he faced with respect to revenue collection with respect to legal system and the changes that he made in the revenue collection and Indology we have talked about the new br branch of knowledge was emerged to study about India to solve these problems and we have talked about uh, code of gentoo laws which was uh, introduced in 1776 that is nothing but the codification of manusmriti okay translation of manusmriti and then we have talked about calcutta madrasa 1780 that was actually asked as a pre recent prelims question 1784 asiatic society of bengal by william john for promoting the oriental studies and i've told you one fact that warren hastings was the only governor general who was tried for a murder case there was a bengali trader Nanda Kumar, he accused Warren Hastings, uh, Warren Hastings in a corruption charge but later in a fabricated case Nanda Kumar was hanged and in that case Warren Hastings was tried but uh, there was no evidence and he is left free. Okay, so that's what we have done with Warren Hastings. Now, if you are new here, if you are watching my video for the first time, I have done all this history videos. This is actually repetition. Since the prelims is extended, we are starting the new series. Already you can see almost not, if, if not complete, most of the videos, 80% of the history we have done. Okay, so you can get all those videos. This is my telegram channel. You can join the telegram channel. This is my Zia Safir. Zia Safir. My name is Safir. So this is a telegram channel. So this is telegram channel and this is my Instagram ID. This is my Facebook id also or zia ias this is my facebook page so you can get in touch with me in any of this uh, if you have any doubt with respect to history you can see around 300 plus videos on economy we have around 20 modules and 300 plus topics in economy that in itself is complete around 60 percentage i have covered over there and apart from that the online classes are available so if you wish to same as the case with history online classes are available for 100 percent of the syllabus and uh, economy also and same as the case with sociology so you can see my sociology videos history video economy video quantitative aptitude video ethics all these uh, are already there so you can get all these in the telegram channel just subscribe the telegram channel you will see everything there whatever is required for your preparation you will get from there and it is complete in itself the content is the best content that you can ever get from any platform that i can guarantee you okay so or if you have any doubts with respect to your preparation if you need mentorship or guidance or if you want to join my answer writing program or test series if you need to write a test series with me i give you my contact number also this is my number 9790 892 okay or 989 so you can get in touch with me in any of these social media platform if your friends are uh, with sociology optional you can definitely refer to me okay so okay so that's about Warren Hastings. Then the next governor general that we have discussed is actually Lord Cornwallis. I've told you very important governor general. There are few governor generals who was considered very important. First one, Lord Warren Hastings, because he's the first one. Apart from that, Lord Cornwallis. Then we talk about Wellesley. Then we talk about William Bentick. Then we talk about Dalhousie. Then we talk about Lytton, Ripon, Canning, Mountbatten. So these are few governor generals who were considered so important, and you can expect questions all the time, especially in prelims and even in mains also. Lord Cornwallis, you can expect question in mains as well as prelims. There are reforms introduced by Cornwallis. See the iron, the idea, the thing is, uh, Lord Cornwallis was the person who was leading the battle from English side in the American War of Independence. And the person who was a failure over there, when he came to India, he have a huge success story to write. And we are, we are studying about his civil service reform and you're preparing for that. Okay, and still that is there. Police reform, still it is there. Okay, judicial reform. Even our constitution is based on the two key principles that is introduced by Lord Cornwallis. That is equality before law and rule of law. Okay, these are the two. And in fact, if you see the British contribution, that is immense. You should not uh, see only negative, uh, you know, uh, outcomes or 
you should not see the British rule only in that negative perspective. There are a lot of positives. The law and order situation improved immensely, drastically. The changes that they have made in law, like the concepts like equality before law, rule of law, etc., introduced, and that serves as the most important pillars of our constitution even now. Okay, and then if you see the law and order situation, if you see uh, anti Sadi resolution, if you see Vidori Marriage Act, if you see ban on female infanticide, ban on human sacrifice, okay, railways what more so and uh, education when we talk about maculum minute or woods dispatch or hunder commission especially woods dispatch all these are the good contribution so there are a lot of positive sides also but whether it is intentional is it done for the purpose of uh, uplifting the indian or not is a difficult question and it is a different question that we will address anyway i'll give you the better perspective to look into that also okay so even in history also we need perspectives and in all these discussions we are i'm giving you that perspective to see the things in a different way okay so when we discuss about uh, lord converse i'm not getting into that we're basically uh, civil service reform one thing you can refer to the previous video then uh, police reforms okay so he introduced uh, uh, you know police he appointed police officials he established police stations on the basis of you know uh, area okay and then uh, number of police stations together it is a circle the police station is headed by daroga circle is headed by superintendent of police that's about judicial that's about police reform then when we talk about judicial reform i've told you this can be a separate question judicial co or the cornwallis code that is judicial reform there was changes in the structure as well as there was changes in the law for example i've told you already equality before law rule of law etc nobody's about the law even the governor general also have to work within the law that's what i mean by rule of law equality before law when we talk about till then there was no equality if a rich and poor is coming the judge will listen to the rich person in case of an eyewitness uh, uh, statement similarly upper caste and lower caste the judge will listen to the upper caste so there was no equality but now that uh, equality was introduced but when we talk about this equality this is among the indians if it is a between indian and english there is no such kind of equality also okay so that is what we have discussed and then uh, we have also discussed about few diwani courts the four diwani courts that was established by lord convoy at dhaka patna calcutta murshidabad and later when we discuss about 1833 charter act i have told you that these four diwani courts which were established by lord convoy at dhaka patna calcutta murshidabad were to be abolished and instead a high courts to be set up and we can see high courts later will will be setting up in 1857 onwards but in different places okay so that's about lord convolis and then one more important point that we have discussed under lord convolis was related to the permanent settlement before that also warren hastings tried to do something quinquennial settlement there were five year settlement there were one year settlement both were failures now a uh, comes a permanent settlement and it was implemented in the eastern part of india like bengal bihar orissa some parts of tamil nadu some parts of benares so around 19 percentage of british india is actually covered with permanent settlement what was the system permanent settlement or zamindari settlement that means zamin zamindar will collect the money from the tax from the peasants and will pay to the british so zamindars are the intermediaries okay and you know zamindar the ownership is actually given to the zamindar but understand this ownership is not absolute ownership between zamindar and peasant it is a zamindar who is the owner but between zamindar and the state the state who is the owner just like the zamindar can evict the peasant any point of time if they are not able to pay the tax similarly the state can also evict the zamindar at any point of time if the zamindar is not able to pay the tax and which was introduced through a law that is uh, sunset law 1794 before the sunset of the prescribed time if you are not paying the tax the zamindar will be evicted and new, new zamindar will come okay and uh, i've told you who imp in implemented this lord uh, cornwallis and john shaw john shaw was the deputy and he is going to become the next governor general also so who implemented where it is a eastern part and some parts of tamil nadu and some parts of benares what percentage 19 percentage of british india what was the system i've told you intermediary was there what is the consequences if you see the most important two consequences are chain of intermediaries and absentee landlordism specific to this apart from that high rate of taxation money lenders high rate of interest and then rural indebtedness uh, then rural landless labors poverty deprivation unemployment all these you can write these are the consequences okay Uh, and when we discussed about this i have also talked about the other two land revenue settlements that is riotwari settlement and mahalwari settlement i have told you uh, in riotwari settlement it was actually implemented in different phases first in 1805 then in 1817 and 18 okay it was implemented by thomas munro and reed 
okay and uh, then it was implemented in madras and bombay and central provinces with capital nagpur maximum area madras means almost entire tamil nadu parts of kerala parts of andhra pradesh parts of karnataka so it's a, such a huge territory bombay includes maharashtra gujarat sin that region central province also so it was implemented around 51 percentage of british india so that that itself cover 70 percentage already now these two together okay so it is not the case that when rotwari was implemented zamindari system was abolished that is going on parallelly there in the eastern part this is also going on in the madras and bombay that uh, region and also central provinces okay so 51 percentage of area the system here is slightly different there is no zamindar as the intermediary instead there is a british official who will collect the tax and the ownership is actually given to the peasant so the state and the peasant directly came into the relation and uh, there is obviously money lenders will be there so as long as the peasant pay the tax to the state the peasant is the owner of the land so that's about the uh, you know rotwari system in mahalwari system mahal is a punjabi word its meaning is village so it's actually the village will collect the tax village is responsible for collecting the tax and the person who is responsible or the leader who is responsible to collect the tax from the village or the panchayat is known as lambardar nambardar see rest of the area that is 30 percentage will be the mahalwari system who implemented it is halt mckenzie in 30 percentage of the area that system it is a panchayat will act as the intermediary apart from that the common problems like high rate of taxation emergence of money lenders exploitation of the peasants high rate of taxation okay and the high rate of interest rural indebtedness landless labors poverty deprivation disguised unemployment all these are common to all but zamindari settlement two extra points were there absentee landlordism and chain of intermediary i have told you why the specific problem is there in that particular session in detail i have shown you the diagram also so if you have missed out that video i have told you it is available in the telegram channel you can go and you can watch that video and then you will get the better clarity about that so after talking about lord uh, cornwallis then what we have done we have talked about john shore nothing much important from exam point of view and then we talked about lord wellesley and there we have discussed about a controversy policy that is subsidiary alliance so when we discussed about subsidiary alliance uh, i've told you if the question is about who is the pioneer of this policy it is a french governor duplex if the question is about who introduced it is a duplex when he rendered his army to hyderabad way back in 1740s so subsidiary alliance means it is actually a military help so you are offering a military help to a weaker a kingdom or a weaker king so it's like this this king the like goli or he is facing threat from some neighbors so military help will be offered so the military will be kept outside and will support okay that is what actually subsidiary alliance but wellesley made some modifications and he beautifully used this policy and he made some modifications so that he could expand his army and he could keep his army across india that too without spending anything from their exchequer the entire expenditure of the army will be taken care by the local kings so he made a uh, forceful arrangement as well as voluntary arrangements with the local kings so that they sign this treaty and the entire expenditure of the army will be taken care by the uh, local kings so there are some conditions also the condition include if you sign this treaty you cannot employ any foreigner other than english in your army secondly if you sign this treaty in case of any war treaty or peace treaty you have to firstly inform it to the british see the word inform is very diplomatically used in it means you effectively have to get the permission from the british so it is almost like surrendering the sovereignty so instead of signing this treaty tipu went for fighting a battle so tipu was forced to sign he did not sign he went for the war and that's the fourth anglo mysore war and he died in that war and after the death of tipu mysore signed the treaty in 1799 so this is very important why tipu did not sign the treaty it is a dishonorable pact so there is a very famous statement by the historians that tipu's death in history is understood as an honorable pact uh, no an honorable death than a dishonorable pact okay so you can get a question tipu's death in history is understood as an honorable death than a dishonorable pact discuss comment etc i have seen many people who are writing the test series now also i was evaluating few papers i have seen people writing all the three wars previous three wars all the causes of the wars and the strategies of the tipu and all those things that they have written but none of them are actually 95 percentage of them is not 99 to that extent 99 percentage of them is not writing anything about the uh, you know subsidiary alliance the question is directly from subsidiary alliance if you are not writing that you will you are not going to get any single mark whatever you write in the paper okay so the question what is that dishonorable pact it is all about subsidiary alliance because you are surrendering the sovereignty now the third provision was that uh, 
you know if you sign the treaty an english resident had to be stationed in the capital of that local state who is signing the treaty and the entire expenditure of that english resident had to be taken care by the local king including the guard soldiers the food the clothes every expenditure has to be taken care by the local king and in return the britishers have promised that they will not interfere in the internal matters of the state and which they never did or they hardly did and then they have also promised that they will protect the local state from any external threat but what happened the very fence started eating the crops after some time right in fact britishers became the threat for them well, for example sindh is a state which signed this treaty i've told you which states are signed the treaty you can go back to the discussion and you can see that that is very important so in 1803 sindh is a state which signed the treaty but exactly after 40 years sindh was annexed under british territory and the person who is responsible for the annexation of sindh that is mr charles napier he wrote a letter to the then governor general that is lord ellen borrow in that letter he said that we don't have any right to annex sindh and still we do that and what a piece of rascality it will be so they clearly know that they should not do it because sindh is a state signed the subsidiary alliance and you your role is to protect them and you are annexing and avadh is also a state which signed the subsidiary alliance and later you can see in 1856 avadh was also annexed under a very uh, poor reason they are saying some reason that is misgovernance and even the army members were also not able to digest that and most of the army people in bengal army were actually from avadh so it affected their sentiment and they went for the 1857 revolt One the most important reason for 1857 revolt when we discuss about political that is annexation of avadh and doctrine of laps so and military people were also got annoyed because of this division because avadh was not misgoverned the nawab at that time wajid ali shah was very good and a lot of uh, you know welfare measures have been given to the uh, pu public and you know avadh uh, is a very prosperous state at that point of time lucknowi culture is very famous also so there was no reason to annex avadh under the context of misgovernance but they did it because they wanted to expand their territory okay so and if you look into that annexation the moment avadh was annexed avadh come under the permanent settlement also and most of the uh, army members were the sons of the farmers and in fact they were called or they were known as actually farmers in uniform so it also affected their economic interest because you are you are going to be exploited by the zamindar so that also uh, one of the reason for 1857 revolt we will discuss that in detail when we discuss about 1857 revolt all the technical sides i'll i'll clear but here i don't have time or you know there are obvious limitations to discuss all those things that we will cover in the future okay so that's about uh, uh, lord wellesley and we have also talked about a fort william college which was established in 1800 at calcutta to train the newly appointed civil servants in the local languages like hindi and urdu and that college was closed down in 1802 because of the difference of opinion between court of directors and the board of control etc okay so uh, we have also said that the first and the only principal of that college was john gilchrist and then we have discussed about uh, very famous person that is lord minto in that we have talked about uh, charter act of 1813 there were two important provisions that we have discussed as end of monopoly except in two items that is trade in tea products and trade with china and i have explained you how it led to deindustrialization in india and the next governor general policy also changed because of this charter act of 1813 okay so that is the impact in most important impact is it led to deindustrialization in india second point that we have actually discussed is uh the company was directed to spend rupees 1 lakh for the purpose of betterment of education in those areas where they have control in right so this is actually the first step that they are taking towards the betterment or improvement of education in india and you can see later a lot of measures have been taken and there are a lot of milestones when we discuss about education the first is actually in 1813 charter act then you will see something in 1835 in terms of macula minute and then in 1837 persian was replaced with english as the official language 1854 woods despatch 18 82 hundred commission like that you can see a lot of mail, milestones and you know if you are writing a history question with, which is related to education or if you are talking about as an essay all these things has to be discussed because education system has evolved over a period of time and the first step towards the modern education is actually starting at this point of time in 1813 charter act okay then after that we have discussed about the period of lord hastings 
and I've told you there is a shift in policy and we have also talked about third Anglo Maratha war the Peshwa institution was abolished and the Peshwa Baji Rao too was beaten and he was uh, he was sent to Vitur okay so I've told you the reason why they are in need of more and more areas because Charter Act of 1813 uh, that is allowing many more companies to come to India so they are in need of markets and they are also in need of raw materials so in for this they need to have a complete political control and they started expanding their territory till then there was no such policy during Hastings time they started expanding their ter territory and you can see annexation of Awadh, annexation of Sindh and extensively it will be used by doctor this through doctrine of lap lapse by Dalhousie and that led to 1857 revolt so most important reason for 1857 revolt is actually political this annexations and Jansi Rani would not have been participated if she was not alienated from that particular kingdom right similarly there are more political reasons than any other reason and different people were fighting the revolt for different reason and had it been one but uh, so had there been, uh, you know, if that revolt would have been won by the Indians, what would have happened is a hypothetical question. Okay, so let's not get into that dis uh, discussion now, but I'll discuss that obviously later. So uh, that's about uh, Hastings. Hastings, actually there is a change in policy. For example, why they are in need of that Deccan region? Because if there is a cotton factory in England, they are in need of cotton. They can't get it from US because US already got independence. So the choice is Egypt and India. So they prefer India. So in India, which region cotton is grown? It is. Uh, it requires black soil or the regular soil. So it is in the Deccan region. So they are the area which benefited them the most they started annexing that is a simple idea and then we have talked about lord william bentick under which i have talked about raja ramohan roy contribution we talked about anti sadi resolution and i have told you sati was declared as culpable homicide not amounting to murder and a maximum punishment of 10 years of rigorous imprisonment was given for those who instigate or compel the female to commit suicide and then we have also talked about anti tugi law and i have told you how the law and order situation was improved drastically during british law and then we have talked about 1833 Charter Act and I've told you that Governor General of Bengal became Governor General of India and the first Governor General of India was Lord William Bentick and the council members which were which was reduced to three in the Pitts India Act once again increased to four okay and the fourth member was a law member that is Lord Macaulay then one provision was related to education uh, not education civil services I've told you no discrimination should be made in the recruitment of civil services on the basis of sex color creed place of birth etc although civil services was introduced in 1793 it was not to any open competitive exam it is not for Indians but now after this Indians can enter into the civil service then the two surviving monopoly also ended and I've told you that for the Vani courts which are established by Lord Cornwallis at Dhaka, Patna, Calcutta, Murshidabad were also to be abolished and instead High Court to be set up. So these are the five provisions in the 1833 Charter Act. Then one point that we missed out there is actually, in fact if I discuss that the this, this discussion will be over so I may not get time to complete that rest of the area that I am supposed to cover but anyway I will discuss that it is related to macula minute it is related to education so I have told you 1813 they have taken the first step then in 1835 you can see there is a debate which is going on between two groups they are the anglicist and orientalist so anglicist are those people who want to give education in English model and in English medium whereas orientalist they are supporting education in the Indian model through either vernacular language or classical language there is a division among themselves also and finally anglicist won the debate and they have decided that they are going to give education to Indians in English model and in English medium it is about higher education okay and they are not going to give education to the masses not to all but to few so they are going to select few people and they are going to give education higher education to few people with the assumption that these few people who's getting the English education in English model will teach rest of the Indians in the vernacular language this is what you call a trickle down theory or downward filtration theory you throw something to top it will come down that's what you mean by trickle down you educate these few they will educate the others but it never happened trickle down never happened because those people who got English education and English model they became more English than English themselves their accent changed their dress dress habit their food habit etc changed more than the Europeans so they were completely cut off from the mainstream society and they were not interested in teaching the rest of the others in vernacular language so they even started speaking vernacular language in a wrong accent like the English will do okay so they totally cut off from the society so this was actually a failure macular minute was a failure and later you can see uh, Woods despatch later okay so I hope this is clear it is about uh, macular minute it is about giving education to a minority minority means 
not minority community minority means hardly one percentage of the indians with the assumption that they will teach rest of the others the main assumption is trickle down approach so this is trickle down theory or trickle trickle down approach of the downward filtration theory okay so that is what actually followed in the maculae minute and english model education in english medium so that's about maculae minute and the next governor general is 1835 to 36 charles metcalf so when we talk about charles metcalf what we need to discuss is actually press freedom so already i've talked about this uh, you can you need to refer to that video in detail we have discussed around 15 minutes but here i don't have the time to do that when we discuss about press freedom you have to discuss or prepare this in a wikipedia style you need to know the first So when you talk about press, you need to prepare this in a Wikipedia style. You have to know what is the first newspaper published in India, who is the author or the editor. The Bengal Gazette was the first one, who was the editor James Augustus Hickey. The first Indian language newspaper by Rajaram Mohan Roy in Bengali language. Okay, So you need to know all these, uh, the first Indian language newspaper, the first newspaper which was published in India, all this idea should be there so press freedom this is very controversial now press freedom was given sometimes it will be taken back when you see lord Lytton. press freedom will be taken back and it will be given again so this is actually a very controversial uh, thing in history okay so that's about charles metcalf nothing more uh, that we need to discuss under charles metcalf so that's about the session uh, i hope you understood everything that we have discussed today if you have any doubt in any of the videos that we have discussed so far you can get in touch with me here that's my instagram id okay or you can join the telegram channel you will get all my videos over there everything is there or you can see here this is a telegram channel or uh, this is the Instagram ID. These two are my Facebook page. You can get in touch with me in any of this. If you want to learn economy with me or history with me or general studies, any subjects, you can, if you need regular classes, you can get in touch with me or the online classes are available with study IQ. You will get all those classes. Still, you will get my YouTube videos in this Telegram channel. Okay. So I hope you understood everything that we have discussed. So see you guys. Thank you.